my dear brothers and sisters welcome to this swami vivekananda yoga anusandhan samsthan or in short s vyasa yoga university many people ask how can i have a university for yoga because their concept of yoga was very limited to only asanas but swami vivekananda gave a very broad spectrum of yoga consisting of the four main streams of yoga gnana yoga raja yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga based on our traditional texts of yoga including all the upanishads and others and this university is the most unique university now it has been raised into the category one university by the university grant commission namaste the indian government 4 years ago mooted the idea of celebrating the national philosophers day in the month of may every year coinciding with the birthday of shri adi shankaracharya it is celebrated to honor the philosophical reflections around the world it is a day for the people to share their thoughts openly explore and discuss new ideas and inspire public debates and discussions on society's challenges contemporary problems and solutions from the philosophies it aims at honoring human dignity and diversity sir the most eminent philosophers of india were vedic upanishad thinkers and sages who have established six system of indian philosophy Mahavira and Gautama Buddha in ancient times during medieval period we had three acharyas namely Sri Adi Shankaracharya Ramanuja Madhva and Nimbarka during modern period we had Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa Swami Vivekananda Sri Arbindu Jiddu Krishnamurti Professor M Hiranayya Dr S Radhakrishnan and many more today we think about those philosophers understand their philosophies and try to implement some of their thoughts in our lives for spiritual enhancement we offer our grateful thanks to the officers of jain university for providing us an opportunity to address your dynamic students and staff on this special occasion now professor mk shridhar Registrar Svyasa Yoga University and Fulbright Scholar USA will speak on six system of Indian philosophy called as Shat Darshana. Namaste. On this occasion of National Philosophers Day being celebrated all over India, I offer my grateful thanks to the officers of the Jain University and especially to honorable Chandra Jain the honorable chairman of the Jain institutions and also to the pro vice chancellor Dr Sandeep Shastri the vice chancellor and others and especially to Dr Rajani Jairam who is the professor of Sanskrit at the department and the dean of student affairs for giving me an opportunity to share the thoughts on the six systems of indian philosophy as a very word denotes philosophy means love of wisdom it is a greek word which has two words namely philos and sophia philos means love of sophia means wisdom so combined together philosophy becomes the love of wisdom wisdom in our eastern thoughts is called viveka that which we are going to distinguish between good and bad right wrong noble ignoble etc and come to a conclusion and that perception is called viveka philosophy should give us viveka and philosophy as a branch speaks of the understanding of human behavior it speaks of how the people behave what are their nature how they should conduct themselves how they should conduct in the society and the nation and the world at large 
philosophy also speaks of the search for truth and knowledge. Truth is Satya. Satya in its highest sense is supreme reality or ultimate reality itself in uh, Eastern philosophy and especially in the six darshanas it is called Brahman. Ultimately to know this supreme reality or Brahman or Parabrahman becomes the aim and the goal of philosophy and also about knowledge. Knowledge in its absolute sense is basically knowledge of your own self. There are various types of knowledge, Paravidya and Aparavidya as elaborated in the Mundaka Upanishad. Dve Vidye Veditavye Pare Aparecha. So, we have to learn two types of knowledge, Para the supreme knowledge and Apara the fundamental knowledge. Fundamental knowledge that is Apara, Vidya knowledge will lead us to para vidya or supreme knowledge to know about your own self. So, philosophy helps us to know our own selves. What is our role in this world? Who am I? Ko hum. Then we get the answer, I am that, so hum. So, this concept of knowing oneself, knowing about the world, the relationship between me and the external world, the relationship between us and the external world and the cosmos all comprises of philosophy. This philosophy is called darshana in Sanskrit. It is derived from root of the Sanskrit verb drishir prekshane or drish to know, to understand, to perceive and to realize. Prekshane to see, to observe. So, parikshataha, parikshya, having examined and sarvatra, so everywhere having seen. So, it is through the introspection of the sages we get this. Rushehe darshanat, by the perception of the sages and the seers. So, there is a relationship between this world, ourselves and the external world of reality. Once we understand this relationship, then when we turn inward and start meditating upon about our own self, then about the world, then we get flashes of intuition, we get antar jnana. This antar jnana is also called perception or darshana. So, darshana deals with various types of subject matter. Subject matter of darshan or philosophy consists of reflection as I already told you, antar jnana. That means to understand within yourself, to realize within yourself and to experience within yourself. Then articulation, pragnavada means doing a wonderful argument and a philosophical argument. Then we arrive at a conclusion. Arjuna was engaged in some pragnavada. Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Pragnavadanscha Bhashase, you are engaging in a Pragnavada or articulation, very quite an intelligent articulation, which does not hold good in this main front of the battlefield. You have to fight against your enemies, but you are engaged in philosophical deliberation like a philosopher. So then, argument, Vada, Vade, Vade, Jayate, Tattva Bodha, it is said. Argument and counter argument will lead us to enlightenment of the philosophy, enlightenment of knowledge. Then, analysis. A subject is taken and it is systematically analyzed and we arrive at the conclusion. That is analysis or vishleshana. Then, there are various schools of thought. The various schools of thought appear to be apparently opposite in nature and contradictory in nature, we take them, analyze and arrive at a synthesis. This synthesis or samanvaya is also a subject matter of philosophy. Then, deduction, sankshepa, taking away, subtracted, you know, deriving of conclusion by reasoning, tarka, and also engaging in negation, 
for example not not so not so brahman is not this world brahman is not this animate world brahman is not this inanimate world he should be something else which is employed in the upanishads called neti or not so not so through this neti concept also deduction also we arrive at a conclusion then the induction we induce there is an initial experience having studied the books avare shrotavyaha mantavyo nididhyasitavyaha he is declared in the upanishad in the bruhadaranya kanda the upanishad so first we have to hear then we have to think over it again and again contemplate over it then nididhyasana meditated upon so this experience internal experience and inference of a generalized conclusion from a particular instance will lead you to reality that is called induction or sankshepa then fallacy hetva bhasa false or mistaken idea so we mistake the rope for the serpent we mistake the conch shell for silver all these are mistaken or ideas so then plausible argument using false or invalid inferences finally paradox or virodha bhasa statement seemingly contradictory or opposite to common sense yet may be true so these are the various subject matter of philosophy then what is the branch of philosophy philosophy deals with metaphysics or ontology called nature of being means we exist the world consists of so many animate inanimate objects they all exist what is significance of these things we have to understand that next is epistemology theory of knowledge so in order to understand this world to understand ourselves to remove the doubts to have clarifications we employ valid means of knowledge called pramanas that is epistemology the question is can we know everything through metaphysics epistemology answer is yes or no yes it can be known then if it is to be known how much is the scope of that knowledge all comes under this branches and then comes the ethics individual ethics societal ethics ethics of the state ethics of the nation and ethics of the world at the global ethics how one should conduct within himself in the society and the nation and the world at large so individual ethics normal ethics normative ethics global ethics and so on here comes how to live and questions about morality then aesthetics we all love beauty we all love principles of taste and beauty the fine arts the lalita kalas dance drama music and how to appreciate the beauty of nature the beauty in a fine arts the beauty in painting all these things comes under aesthetics then logic analyze systematically analyze and come to a conclusion that is logic inductive logic and deductive logic like you know all men are mortal aristotle was a man so aristotle was a mortal so this through this deductive logic we come to the conclusion then apart from that there is philosophy of religion and philosophy of science then what about the value of philosophy philosophy is gives you a food for the good of mind mind is monkey in nature it has to be stabilized this mind has to be calm made calm and quiet for that we have to give some food as we give the food to our body and to the stomach so philosophy becomes a food for the mind then it gives us knowledge unity and systems to body of science free from convictions prejudices and some dogmas or beliefs the value of philosophy <coughs> deals with the truthful answers to fundamental questions of life and universe it removes arrogant dogmatism of faiths and people gives a broad minded nature for us it liberates us from conflicts clashes dukkhas unhappiness then sorrow shoka shoka moha jahati this is what said in the upanishad it takes away from shoka sorrow and moha delusion it bestows on philosophical contemplation it helps in knowing the knowable that is the being leads to becoming brahmavit brahmaiva bhavati a knower of brahman becomes brahman itself 
and ultimately as Swami Ranganathananda ji gives, says it gives freedom, physical freedom, mental freedom, intellectual freedom and finally spiritual freedom from all actions and all emotions and we get liberated as far as the six systems of Indian philosophy are concerned. Almost on the same lines, the Western thinker and the great philosopher Bertrand Russell spoke about the value of philosophy thus, I quote, Philosophy is to be studied not for the sake of any definite answer to its questions, since no definite answers can, as a rule, be known to be true, but rather for the sake of the question themselves. Because these questions enlarge our conception of what is possible, enrich our intellectual imagination and diminish the dogmatic assurance which closes the mind against speculation. But above all, because through the greatness of the universe which philosophy contemplates, the mind also is rendered great and becomes capable of that union with the universe which constitutes its highest good. The highest good was the summum bonum of the western philosophy. It was also that of virtue as goodness. So all these were summarized by Bertrand Russell in his book Problem of Philosophy. Unquote. The six systems of Indian philosophy called Darshana are Nyaya philosophy by Gautama or Gautama Vaisheshika philosophy or darshana by Kanada, Sankhya philosophy or Sankhya darshana by Kapila, Yoga philosophy or Yoga darshana by Patanjali, Purva Mimamsa philosophy or Purva Mimamsa darshana by Jaimini, and Uttara Mimamsa philosophy or Uttara Mimamsa darshana by Badarayana. These are called the Vaidika Darshanas because they owe their validity or allegiance to the Vedas. They take the testimony of the Vedas. Therefore, they are called Vaidika Darshanas or in English orthodox systems of Indian philosophy. Apart from that, there are three more philosophies. The Charvaka by Lokayata, Charuvak pleasant speech, then Buddhism or Baudhamata by Gautama, Buddha, and Jainism or Jainamata by Mahavira. These three does not adhere to the validity of the Vedas or testimony of the Vedas. There, therefore, they are called the Avaidika Darshanas or Vedetara Darshanas or in English, heterodox systems of Indian philosophy. Then, what is the basis of these six darshanas? The basis of these six darshanas are Nyaya or syllogism deals with logic, Vaisheshika deals with the physical world and these two become the groundwork of philosophy. Then Sankhya dealing with numbers speaks of cosmology of the universe. Yoga is deals with the psychology of the mind so practical in nature. Purva Mimamsa means the ancient law through which evolved the ideas. Then Uttara Mimamsa is a living practical faith which gives you the final ideas. All these deal with perception of truth or satya from different angles. Satyasya satyam iti tadvana is the famous statement of the Upanishad. And from truth we go to higher truth, from higher truth we go to the highest truth. All these six systems of Indian philosophy believe in law of karma, which you know started in the Vedas, got as little elaborated in the Upanishads, in the epics, that is the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, but became totally evolved and exhaustively elaborated in the Puranas. So, all these deal with the law of karma and the theory of rebirth. Swami Prabhavanandaji 
summarizes this doctrine of karma and the theory of rebirth in one sentence thus. The present existence is a resultant of all the actions good or bad or noble ignoble we did in our past life or past lives and our future existence depends upon the actions good and bad noble and ignoble which we have done in our present life. This summarizes the whole concept of the theory of karma or doctrine of action and theory of rebirth or punar janma which also is the basis for the six darshanas and all our puranas. Then the next is when the question is raised as to who am I, the ultimate thing is to attain moksha or deliverance. Muchyate anena iti mokshaha, the by which I am liberated, totally get I liberated. I am free, free from all shackles of birth, rebirth and death. I am free from all kleshas or difficulties. I am free from shoka, sorrow and moha, delusion. This is the liberation and people having realized this can lead a life of jivan muktas or liberated souls as told by Shankaracharya in his Viveka Chodamani and after this existence, after the end of this life they get united with the supreme reality and that is the final moksha. And also these six systems believe in the nature of true self. Who am I? What is my uh, experience. What is my relationship with the external world? Relationship with the external world of reality. All these things are combined in knowing about your own self. That is nature of true self. Then finally setting free. So based on this, the six systems of Indian philosophy, the Bharati Yashad Darshanas, attack, you know, angled and you know, they concentrated from their own perspectives and arrived at a conclusion. So, let us now understand the Nyaya and the Vaisheshika. Nyaya and the Vaisheshika have some similar concepts, so they are combined as Nyaya Vaisheshika. In the same way, Sankhya and Yoga, they are dualistic in nature, so they are combined and called as Sankhya Yoga. So, let us take up the Nyaya Darshana, which was established by Gautama or Gautama, the best among the sages. All these six sages were during the same time, say around 600 BCE, around 550 to 650 BCE they were present. All these blossomed at the same time around 2600 years ago and now they continued and had their evolution and finally blossomed which is being practiced by people all over the world. So, all these uh, six darshanas are in the form of sutras. Sutra means an aphorism or a formula. What is the definition of a sutra? Alpaksharam asandigdam saravat vishvato mukam astobham anavadyancha sutram sutra vidho viduhu. A sutra or a formula should be alpakshara, should have precious little so, uh, letters or sentences or words. Asandigdam, it should be without any doubt or ambiguity. Saravat, it should give you essence in a single line or a single sentence or a formula. Vishvato Mukham, it should give you a broad idea and a thought and summarize the whole thing. Then Astobham, it should not come in groups but should come independently. Anavadyam, it should be faultless and blemishless. So, all this comprises of sutra and aphorism and a knower of sutra, of all these sutras is called sutra with a knower of sutra. For example, in our high school, you and me have studied, all of us have studied dealing with the diffraction, dispersion of light which is given in one sutra or a formula in physics, 1 over u plus 1 over v is equal to 1 over f. In the same way, Newton's law of motion is given in a single formula f is equal to ma. 
or Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, both uh, you know the general theory of relativity and special theory of relativity is given in one sutra or a formula E is equal to mc square. Like that all the six systems of Indian philosophy adopt this concept of sutra in order to explain in a wonderful manner their own concepts in a very intelligent succinct style. So, Nyaya Darshana deals with Nyaya, it is derived from Ni to carry, Ni Ayate Iti Nyaya, that which is carried, forward, proceeded. So, that is Nyaya or syllogism. These accept the validity of the Vedas pertaining to nature of the universe. So, there is a progressive development we see in these six systems as I told you from we they move from truth seekers of truth knowing of truth to higher truth from the higher truth to the highest truth. Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophy employs the seven categories called the Padarthas and they expound Darshana for attaining Abhyudaya and Nishreyas. Abhyudaya means growth and unfoldment in life or character is called Abhyudaya. Nishreyasa is absolute good or highest good as told by Burton Russell. It is the immediate perception of ultimate realities of self and the universe. So, for that they give seven categories or substances in Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophy. They are matter, dravya, quality, guna, or attribute, action or karma, genus or samanya, speciality or vishesha, inseparable relationship, samavaya and negation abhava. The whole world comprises of these seven substances. Dravya, guna, karma, samanya, vishesha, samavaya, abhavaha, saptapadarthaha. The whole world is made up of these things. Actually you understand as you see this, the other six can be combined in one substance which is visible in nature that is matter or dravya. So, this dravya, they are nine in number, earth, prithvi, the five great elements or gross elements called sthula comprises and atomic sukshma in nature that comprises of water or apaha, energy, tejaha or tejas, wind, vayu, ether or akasha, time or kala, quarters or dik, soul or atma, mind or manas. Among these nine, the first five you can see by your naked eye, that is matter, that is earth, water, energy, wind and ether. The next four are sukshma, that is the time, quarters, soul and the mind which can only be experienced. So, these Padarthas which are nine in number, we, you know which was a part of the seven substances, the, from the seven substances we got the, later we got the Dravya, from the Dravya, the nine Dravyas and understanding these Padarthas systematically and correctly, we get liberation. For example, Atma or the soul is eternal in nature and this precedes the manas or the mind, the indriyas, the sense organs, the five motor organs and the five sensorial organs, pair of eyes, the nose, the tongue, the ears and the skin, these are the five sensorial organs. Like that we have the five motor organs, pair of arms, pair of feet, the mouth, the generative organs, the excretory organs, the five. So, the five motor organs and the five sensorial organs combined together is called indriyas or dasha ten indriyas. So, they all have the tendency to proceed to the external world, understand the external world or through these sense organs we experience the external world. When this Atma or the soul is combined with Manas or the mind, we get consciousness. Consciousness of the external world, Chetana, 
consciousness is called chetana and pragna and jnana and we get the knowledge or the jnana of the external world we get the knowledge of our own self these padarthas also have various karma or actions action is of five types an object can go upward it can come downward it can move to the left it can move to the right it can contract it can expand and movement in general a general quality for example every cow has some physical features that is called the generality cowness which is called gotva in nyaya vishesika philosophy and higher is beingness which is almost we can compare that to the platonic concept of ideas then vishesha speciality for example uniqueness or speciality for example bull has horns and humps but a cow doesn't have so that is becomes a special for the all the bulls in the world and to give you an example you know all the human beings have the generality all the human beings have some general characteristic males have some general characteristics females have some general characteristics physical characteristic that is the samanya nature but among this the men have separate qualities women have separate qualities that becomes the vishesha then samamaya separate and inseparable this is the objective reality for example it appears to be separate but they are inseparable example sugar and sweetness the sweetness is present in jamun sweetness is present in gulab jamun jahangir jalebi halwas you taste each of these savouries or delicacies and sweets are different the sweetness which is present in these sweets are different but still you cannot separate the sweetness from these sweet objects so that separate but inseparable is called samamaya or the concomitant relationship like the soul and the body so as long as the soul is there in the body the body is alive but when the soul goes out of the body the body becomes dead but still they are in separate but inseparable relationship this was taken up later by ramanuja acharya in his philosophy where he said anga angi bhava shesha sheshi bhava etc so then what is the you have to understand this concept of the nyaya vaisheshika then what about this concept of the gods nyaya vaisheshika says there is what you call it as the individual soul jivatman which is present in every living being of the world apart from that in the cosmos there is a supreme self or the paramatman but they are but both of them are not different only you have to realize that para brahman or the paramatman within yourself so he as a god becomes the controller and gives the physical order of the universe as a law giver he gives you moral order of the universe and as a governor he gives you initiates the cause and the effect relationship so the effect is of two types material cause the whole world belongs to this material cause then the efficient cause who makes the world who creates the world that is the god so he becomes the efficient cause so nyaya shishika brings in the concept of cause and effect relationship the effect is present in the cause in a latent way or a dormant way how it is take a handful of groundnut seeds put those groundnut seeds into the mixer or into the crusher crush it very well what do you get a groundnut oil where was this groundnut oil this groundnut oil is the effect seeds are the cause and i am the agent who perform this action so cause leads to the effect and there should be an agent for it every effect or karya precedes the cause or the karana so that way cause and effect relationship happens in the world self the body 
the senses and the mind. A combination of all this will lead us to ignorance or jnana and lead us to worldly bondage, samsara. So we get it into this circuit and passage of life and we are in the cycles of birth and death again. Punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi janani, jatare, shayanam, as told by Shankaracharya. So in his Bajagovinda Stotram. So we should get out of this series of birth, death, rebirth. For that, we should get out of Raga and Dvesha, attachment and hatredness. Hatredness about oneself, about the external world, about the other people. Be away from the attachments. Then let us be away from the sinful acts and the sufferings, kleshas, and get the knowledge or jnana that gives us liberation. Next comes the Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya and Yoga are considered to be dualistic because they have a common feature and a reality called Purusha and Prakriti. Let us not mistake Purusha for human being, no, or man. Purusha means supreme reality. Purusha means the ultimate reality. As many Purushas are there or living beings in this world, as many Purushas are there. But Prakriti is only one. The Sankhya system is propounded by sage Kapila. It is said that he was living before Bhagavan Buddha. Kapila is also considered a historical figure. But according to Bhagavata Purana, he is the incarnation of Vishnu. He said that this knowledge of truth was given for the good of humanity. Sankhya philosophy deals with the Purusha and the Prakriti. It also speaks of how to get rid of the three types of difficulties or tapas or the heat, physical and mental heat, Adhyatmika, Adhibhautika and Adhidaivika. In fact, as told by Richard Garb, I quote, in Kapila's doctrine, for the first time in the history of the world, the complete independence and freedom of the human mind, its full conformance in its own powers were exhibited. How to free oneself from three kinds of sufferings or traya, tapas, tapatraya, which is called dukkha. The first one is adhyatmika, diseases of the body, mental unrest, mental problems, various types of diseases by which we get affected is adhyatmika. Adhibhautika, extraneous castes, man or beast, people, you know, get affected by the bites of snakes, by accidents, by other types of things that comes under Adi Bhautika, attacked by animals, killed by animals, trampled by elephants. All this comes under Adi Bhautika. Then Adhya, Adhi Daivika, supernatural elements like people being killed by lightning, by flashes, by floods from tsunami, etc., etc. So, we suffer from any of these three. We should get out of this pain or tapa or klesha. So, that arises from right discrimination between self, that is atma and non-self, anatma as told by Vijnana Bhikshu, for which we should get the clear knowledge of the world, the physical world and about our own self. So that is dealt by Kapila in this fashion. The world is made up of Prakriti, means primordial nature. It is both in manifested and unmanifested state. This Prakriti is made up of the five gross elements, you know, you are already familiar with that. Prithi Vyapte Jovayu Akasha. And it is there with the five sense organs, then the five motor organs, and it is made up of the 
five subtle elements or rasatanmatras or the delicate atomic nature of the five gross elements tanmatras so totally it became 20 then the intelligence then ahankara then buddhi the manas finally prakriti and the purusha all combined becomes the 25 elements it also includes the internal instruments of the antakarana so all these comprises of the prakriti who is distinct which is distinct from purusha prakriti has three gunas sattva rajas and tamas sattva is noble in nature rajas is feverish activity and tamas is dormant activity every being and living being and non living beings the animate and the inanimate objects have any one of these three for example in the scorching rays of the sun the bright rays of the sun you can see the sattvic guna in the powerful erupting volcano you can see rajoguna in a block of granite you can see tamoguna so even among the nature of the world you have these three gunas the same thing is present in us every person has sattva rajas and tamas some days it is sattvic some days rajasic some days tamasic in nature in a whole day in a single day sometimes i may be sattvic sometime i may be rajasic and sometime i may be tamasic so they move in equilibrium and in equilibrium and they are a product of the prakriti therefore it is said ajam ekam lohita krishna shuklam this prakriti is ajam unborn because it is only one in nature the primordial ekam one it is unborn and single in nature lohita which is red in color krishna black in color shuklam white in color lohita represents rajasic nature shukla represents sattvic nature and krishna represents tamasic nature prakriti is a balance prakriti balances and imbalances these three which is present most of the time in an unmanifested state called avyakta but it comes into manifestation vyakta and goes back into unmanifested state that's how the world uh, evolution creation sustenance and devolution goes continuously that's what krishna elaborated in the bhagavad gita to arjuna avyakta adini bhutani vyakta madhyani bharata avyakta nidananyeva tatra ka paridevana all the living beings in the world were in a state of unmanifested state for some time they came to the intermediate state of manifestation they were born they lived and they were joyful happy dismayed etc and they go back to their own state again avyakta nidhananyeva they go back to the unmanifested state so why one should worry about this thing so this is this prakriti interplays and when a purusha gets associated with prakriti the creation begins the universe happens the man gets affected purusha gets affected with all his gnanendriyas karmendriyas mahat buddhi ahankara or egoism intelligence uh, internal instruments and so on are get into the circuit of life or the passage of life and he suffers and suffers when he gets disassociated from prakriti he gets liberation how what is the nature of prakriti then this prakriti has three gunas and these three gunas are sattva rajas tamas elaborated very well by krishna in the 14th chapter of the bhagavad gita called gunatre vibhaga yoga what is the course of this misery that is because of uncertainty uncertainty about our own life about our existence uncertainty of the universe you know just understand the uncertainty principles of heisenberg so we will always live in this world of uncertainty then uselessness the things we are doing good or bad whether they are useful useless we don't know then the fleeting nature 
of earthly and sensual joy that becomes the wrong knowledge so because purusha gets associated with prakriti the spirit get associated with the primordial nature that brings us to this misery so purusha and prakriti combine will leads to dukkha or attachment purusha when gets or disassociated from prakriti he gets sukha or detachment that is liberation so sankhya philosophy gives you direct means to attachment of immediate experience of transcendental purusha which is separated from prakriti sankhya speaks of realism for example world of thoughts and means it is a mixture of happiness sukha misery dukkha or unhappiness and moha or delusion in one of the beautiful example given in the sankhya karika imagine a man marries a very young beautiful and this young beautiful gives happiness to her husband sukha and she raises jealousy in other women who are not that beautiful so that is dukkha and it gives us delusion to other lustful men moha so the world is sukha dukkha mohatmaka we should come out of this finally we should be move away from this sukha dukkha moha then sankhya philosophy apart from realism also speaks of dualism there are two realities finally purusha and prakriti and as you see from this the difference between purusha and prakriti as follows purusha is inactive prakriti active separate and material cause evolution of mind or mental and mental matter or physical it is a prime mover purusha prime mover whereas prakriti stands still so finally the example is the magnet and the iron filings a lame man that is purusha sitting on a blind man prakriti or the example famous example of ulysses and the old man purusha is the unchangeable principle of intelligence whereas prakriti is the changing principle so that way we have to understand our real nature move away from these consecutive dualities and realize the real nature of the gunas the trigunas the sattva the rajas and the tamas then you get the liberation the next is called yoga darshanam or yoga philosophy yoga philosophy is one of the oldest philosophy in the world it goes back to classical pre classical and historic periods for example the reference to yoga is found in the rigveda itself the new date of the veda is around 9500 bce so it goes to around 11500 bce in the vedas we find the word mantra japa karma yoga etc when you combine these word it becomes mantra yoga japa yoga karma yoga and so on so that way yoga was present in the vedic time itself apart from that when the excavations were done in many places in harappa mohenjodaro shanudaro and other places by archaeologists one could see the seals and the mohars where the postures of some of the yogas were represented now the date of the antiquity of the harappa mohenjodaro civilization also called as indus saraswati civilization has been pushed by archaeologists a number of archaeologists such as kalyana raman navaratne raja ram and others it goes to around 6500 bce so that way yoga is quite popular from the times of the vedas because as we from the uh, 
uh, ancient passages uh, that our sages and seers were engaged and engrossed in deep meditation on the subterranean regions of the Himalayas, on the various regions in India. So, that way yoga is the one of the oldest, but the living tradition from India which has been contributed significantly for the whole world. The word yoga is in English means to yoke. Yoking means union of two things. As per Swami Shivananda, yoga means integration and harmony between thoughts, words and deeds or it is integration between head, heart and hands. Stable and peaceful mind is the key to understand Paramatman. As we see in the Vyasa Bhashya, a commentary by sage Vyasa on the Patanjali Yoga Darshana or the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, yoga has been defined as yoga samadhi. Yoga means absorption. Patanjali was the person who concretized this oldest form of yoga in the form of sutras. In his Yoga Sutra, which consists of four sections. The first one is called Samadhi Pada, section dealing with Samadhi or Transcendental Meditation, which has 51 sutras. The next is Sadhana Pada. Sadhana means an instrument to attain that yoga and moksha which has 55 sutras. The next is Vibhuti Pada which deals with the powers by practicing the Antaranga Yoga and the Bahiranga Yoga people will get lot of powers. These powers are elaborated in this third section called Vibhuti Pada consisting of 56 sutras. Then the last one is called Kaivalya Pada or the section dealing with liberation consisting of 33 sutras. All combined we have 196 sutras in which Patanjali speaks of the philosophy of mind, the science of mind, how to control the mind. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. This is what he begins in his second sutra of the Samadhi Pada. The first one is Atha Yoga Anushasana. Then we begin the deliberation into yoga. As the very word denotes, yoga is derived from the root of the Sanskrit verb yuj. Yujjate anena iti yogaha. Yuj means to yoke, to unite, to combine. It is the union between the body and the mind. The union between the body and the soul. Union between the individual soul and the supreme soul. So, that is yoga. That yoga can be attained if we control the mind stuff for the modifications of the chitta. Yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha. Nirodha restraining or controlling vritti hi the modifications of chitta the mind stuff or the mind apparatus. In fact, Swami Vivekananda translates chitta as mind stuff or mind apparatus. And also as we see in the later text, this chitta is not just mind. Chitta is a combination of several things or constituents such as manas or mind, buddhi or intelligence or determinative faculty, ahankara or egoism, manas, buddhi, ahankara, then smriti or remembrance and part of the chit or consciousness. So, manas, buddhi, ahankara, smriti, chit all combined together becomes chitta. So, this chitta undergoes various changes or modifications and all these changes and modifications have to be checked and controlled. Then, you get the realization. The basic nature of the mind is very calm and quiet, but it behaves like a monkey because we are getting thoughts externally. We are getting ideas externally, the thoughts from outside through the external world, ideas, 
thoughts through people places things we interact with people places things and we get emotional we get agitated we are under dismay that will have an impact on our mind so this mind which is basically calm and quiet gets agitated disturbed resulting in diabolical activities or actions otherwise the mind is calm and quiet in fact mind is the chitta we can compare to the bottom of the lake and the mind is the surface and to see the chitta we have to go through the external surface the mind and the external world but take a stone and throw it into this lake called chitta what happens it gets agitated and you cannot see that way we get affected or agitated as told by lao tzu the chinese philosopher he said that the mind is calm and quiet in nature like crystal clear waters of the lake but it gets agitated owing to external influences check and control this you will be happy as told by lao tzu to his intimate disciples during their philosophical deliberations in the morning when they were walking outside in the outskirts of the city so chitta has to be checked and controlled but chitta to be checked and controlled has to be exercised with lot of physical and mental discipline but the mind is a monkey as we see in one of the famous shlokas of sanskrit markatasya surapanan madhye vrushchika damshanam tan madhye bhut samcharam yadva tadva bhavishyati a monkey is basically behaving you know in a very peculiar fashion it cannot sit in one place jumping from here to there and dancing and it had drunk the alcohol and a scorpion has bitten it a goblin or a demon has entered it then look at the plight of that monkey that is the nature of our mind because of the external influences because of the bad memories or the smrutis because of the egoism or ahankara we are unable to exercise our intellect or buddhi so mind gets agitated disturbed as a result we get affected samatvam yoga uchyate balance in mind balance in all our actions poise in action is yoga said by krishna in the bhagavad gita he also said yoga ha karma su kaushalam yoga is balance or skillful action whatever the action you do it should be perfect it should be finish and perfect in nature that is yoga yoga vasistha says mana prashamana upaya ha yogam iti abhidhiyate the method of controlling and checking the mind is called yoga maitri upanishad says sarva samata bhavah maitri bhavah so friendship and fraternity with all the people of the world including our enemies is called yoga it gets modification some you know because of the vrittis or the kleshas some of the kleshas are painful some of them are non kleinful so to get this patanjali elaborates that we should engage into cognitive process called pramana perception and light knowledge called pramana viparyaya sometimes we get into process of mis conception called wrong knowledge that has to be driven away vikalpa sometimes you get illusory and fantasy prone states imagination we should get rid of that sleep nidra state of inert sleepy dullness then remembrance smruti memory of our experiences of our past lives and in this life some bad memories so this will affect our mind this will affect the chitta bhumis or the state of the mind what is the state of our mind according to patanjali it is kshipta means unstable or impulsive look at the behavior of a monkey look at the rajasic people who are always active 9 through 5 or day in and day out from dawn to dusk they are very active mudha 
some people are confused dull witted then vikshipta always distracted they can't concentrate in one single place on a one single point that is vikshipta but some of them are there ekagra single pointedness total absolute single pointedness and niruddha checked and controlled restraint so we have to know these chitta bhumis and practice ekagrata the for that you need stop the modification the chitta vrittis and get into practice called abhyasa and renunciation vairagya abhyasa vairagya abhyam tan nirodha so that is the one thing abhyasa means the uninterrupted disciplined and dedicated practice done with divine aspiration to get absolute freedom total freedom and liberation when it is done for a long time it is becomes practice then have the vairagya detachment or the spirit of renunciation this can be obtained by practicing some physical and mental disciplines they are called yamas and niyamas there are eight limbs of yoga yam niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi uh, ashta angaha ashta angaha ashta eight anga the limbs so yama means to control to check they are basically the moral disciplines ahimsa control of the violent tendencies to not to injure anybody in the world satya control of lying tendencies to speak the truth asteya to control of thieving or stealing tendencies brahmacharya to check and control the brahmacharya and our creative energies and aparigraha to stop possessing things and possessive tendencies these are called the yamas the niyamas are we can say physical disciplines the physical disciplines are shaucha purity or cleanliness at all level physical mental then santosha to be happy all the time tapas disciplined efforts swadhyaya personal study of the book of our choice the discipline or the domain of our choice ishvara pranidhana absolutely surrendering totally all our actions to the god so by doing these yamas and niyamas we get physical and mental disciplines then you move over to asana to sit in a comfortable posture then control your breath which is inhalation and exhalation pracchardana vidharana abhyam va pranasya perfect control of the inhalation and exhalation will lead you to psychic breath checking of the breath and that will cure away a number of diseases after that start concentrating upon one object sustain one object the first five that is yamas niyamas asana pranayama then start with drawing your sense organs the five sense organs called pratyahara these five are called the bahiranga yoga external yoga having established supremacy over this bahiranga yoga start concentrating inwardly called dharana concentrate between your eyebrows sit in a single place calm and quiet undisturbed sit in a same place same time every day concentrate on one object between your eyebrows by closing your eyes if you cannot do that first concentrate on your objects by so opening your eyes and slowly take that object into your mind and then concentrate that is called dharana sustain it for a long time desha bandhas chittasya dharana then intensify that pratyaya ekatanata dhyanam intensify that for more time it becomes dhyana or uh, contemplation then intensify further it becomes samadhi or deep meditation or contemplation where the subject and the object relationship stops there is you start enjoying the absolute bliss 
total bliss which is called the ananda as elaborated in the taittiri upanishad which is the very basic nature of the supreme reality satyam gnanam anantam brahma he is of the nature of satya absolute truth gnana absolute knowledge and ananta absolute eternal bliss you will get that bliss and joy unalloyed bliss when you are still awake and because there is the subject and the object relationship stop i am the subject the external world is the object as long as this duality or dvaita is there you can never get the experience you have to get that feeling of advaita or non qualified monism which can happen when you concentrate more and more in worldly that is what the yoga teaches but before you move into that state of samadhi what happens is you get lot of powers they are 8 in number it is anima mahima chaiva garima lagima tata prapti prakamya mishatvam tvam arvashatvam chashta siddhaya it is elaborated but these are only obstacles in the path of realization enjoy those experiences submit those experiences and those powers at the lotus feet of the lord and you will proceed further so the ultimate thing comes called kaivalya means one and alone in the nature absolute joy absolute experience that is the aim of yoga samadhi means transcendental consciousness in samadhi the individual soul gets merged with the supreme soul or brahman the mind and the intellect are not operative in that stage all of them have submerged into the deep unitary consciousness called samadhi patanjali elaborates on various types of samadhis initially he says samadhi or transcendental meditation or consciousness is of two types sabija and nirbija samadhi with seed and samadhi without seed in samadhi with seed as you see from this slide he makes two more classification sampragnata samadhi and asampragnata samadhi in sampragnata samadhi he says there are types such as savitarka savichara ananda and asmita in asampragnata it is nirvitarka nirvichara ananda and nirbija samadhi it's an elaborate discussion by itself and you by referring to the first chapter or the section of the samadhi pada you will understand please go through that once then in nirbija samadhi it leads you to dharma megha samadhi megha the cloud of dharma righteousness which covers everything through which one becomes pragnana ghana he is endowed with absolute consciousness this absolute consciousness which is like a cloud which surrounds him and the entire environment it leads that person to kaivalya this yoga has taken various forms such as hatha yoga laya yoga and then we have the yoga in the bhagavad gita called karma gnana bhakti and raja yoga so in fact the bhagavad gita is 18 chapters are divided into the first six, six chapters as karma yoga path of action the next six chapters as path of devotion bhakti yoga then the last six as path of knowledge gnana yoga in which also comes path of meditation raja yoga so this yoga initially of patanjali obtained a number of forms and yoga gurus all over the world have taken up this and have branched off and developed their own system of yoga in the last 500 years the next section is that of puru vimamsa propounded by jaimini belonging to 600 bc A commentary to that was written by Shabaras Swami in 400 CE. There are 2,500 aphorisms or sutras 
in Jaimini Purmi Mamsa classified into 12 chapters or sections. They are further split up into various padas and each pada has various adhikaranas. In total, the 2500 aphorisms contain 1000 adhikaranas or subsections. Mimamsa deals with specific subject. There are two ways of interpretation. One way was interpreted by Prabhakara in 650 CE and the other by Kumarila Bhatta in 700 CE. So, what is then the objective of the Mimamsa philosophy? Actually, philo this philosophy was propounded by Jaimini to establish the authority of the Vedas, that Vedas are supreme, that they are anadi, beginningless and ananta, present since the time immemorial and apaurusheya, they are beyond the human conception, they are beyond the human thinking and it is nothing but the word of the God or word of the supreme. They explain the meaning of the Vedas and the Vedic mantras. And the third objective or is to establish the attainment of heaven. As the very word denotes, Mimamsa is derived from root of the Sanskrit verb man meaning thinking or investigating. The Sanskrit word Mimamsa is derived as Miyate Anumiyate Iti Mimamsa means probing and acquiring knowledge or a critical review and investigation of the Vedas. So, as it gives emphasis to the Vedas, it belongs to the Karma Mimamsa and the Karma Kanda of the Vedas. Vedas have three sections Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda, and Upasana Kanda. Karma Kanda deals with actions, then Jnana Kanda deals with knowledge, Upasana Kanda deals with worship. Jaimini's Sutras of Purvi Mamsa deals with Karma Mimamsa or Karma Kanda as it deals with sections dealing with rituals, vidhis and sacrifices, yagna, yaga, yajana and so on. So, it primarily deals with methodology of interpreting the rituals of the Vedas or vidhis and sacrifices to a common man. So, the subject matter is planned very well by Jaimini. It is like our modern cases and modern arguments which goes in the courts of the world in India or elsewhere. Jaimini sutras give a detailed account of sacrifices in their intended purpose. Doctrines of Apurva means never before unexpected and Adrishta unseen or elaborated like an unexpected visitor comes to your home or you will have bought a, a lottery ticket, you would have thrown it elsewhere, suddenly your lottery ticket gets the bumper prize, it is a windfall. So, it is unprecedented, Apurva and unseen. So, it, end, it deals with philosophical propositions and it de, most important it deals with controversies regarding word that is Pada and thought meaning or Artha that is called Arthavada and their interrelationship in relation to rituals that is Vidhis and sacrifices Yagna, Yaga, Yajanas. So, according to Purmi Mamsa, self or Atma is different from the body and the ten sensorial organs are dashendriyas and the mind or manas. Intelligence, buddhi, will, ichha and effort, prayatna are attributes of the soul according to Jaivini. In fact, his concept of presentation is wonderful. In that, it is said, you know, that is very well analyzed by his holiness Chandrasekhar Saraswati Swamiji who says that the problems of or subject of Mimamsa are like modern day court proceedings. To quote, the honorable judge before delivering the judgment 
reviews similar cases decided elsewhere in the country, takes note of them, sees the precedents and gives the judgment based on law of the land. In the same way, adhikaranas are written consistently for preserving the concepts as told by the Swamiji in his work, The Call of the Vedas. Mimamsa philosophy stresses upon work. For example, by doing the Jyotish Tomayaga, one can get heaven. Heaven is very, very important. And performance of ceremonial Vedic rites, Vidhi, which is very important. And one has to follow Dharma, righteousness. Righteousness is elaborated in the Dharma Shastras. It also means duty, responsibility, and ethics, and righteousness. And final goal is attainment of heaven. So, this is what the Purvi Mamsa deals with. Then we come to the last one among the six darshanas, Uttara Mimamsa, which is authored by Badarayana or Sage Vedavyasa. It is the Vedanta, almost coming at the end. It is like the Upanishads. Badarayana wrote these around 500 BCE. It is also called Sharirika Sutra because it explains the nature of the uncontrolled self which is embodied in the human form. Sharira Sambandhi Sharira. These sutras are unintelligible and it dealt with three important concepts Jiva, Jagat, Brahma. Jiva, the individual soul, Jagat, the world, and Brahma, the ultimate reality or supreme Brahman or consciousness. But to elaborate this, he explained and brought out these Uttara Mimamsa consisting of the Vedanta Sutras or the Brahma Sutras or the Sharirika ones, where there are three steps to understand the final truth or the supreme as told in the Bruhadaranyaka Upanishad, Atma Vare Shrotavyo Mantavyo Nididhyasitavya. Atma, the soul, has to be Shrotavya, first heard, then Mantavya, should be thought over, then Nididhyasitavya should be contemplated upon. So finally, Uttarmi Mamsa speaks about truth of self, one's own self. The Vedanta Sutras, they are also called Vedanta Sutras, address to reason and understanding. So, it is Aruta, means particular way and means of belonging that prescribes conduct and methods of meditation. The Uttar Mimamsa, which consists of the Brahma Sutras in 555 numbers deals in fourth chapter. The first chapter deals with Brahman, the ultimate supreme reality, his relation to the world and to the soul of man or jivatma or jiva. Then it speaks of metaphysical reconciliation of various Vedic passages and recorded experience of Brahman or supreme reality by rishis through jnana, karma, bhakti and so on. The second chapter deals with objective objections to view Brahman, the soul Jivatma, world Jagat, and fallacious nature of rival theories and of their proponents. The third chapter deals with how to attain the Brahman. Is it through jnana or karma or bhakti or raja, yoga, which are the one? Then question of rebirth and for those who wish to attain Brahmacharya and finally to attain Supreme Reality. It also deals with psychological and theoretical topics. In the last chapter, it speaks of the fruits of knowledge of Brahman and the length of moksha, how long the moksha is there. Where is there a rebirth? If the rebirth is there for how long? For example, Kshine Punye Martyalokam Vishanti when Punya or the merit 
merit or the meritorious activities of the gods and the sages uh, who have attained the heaven will come down again to increase their punya and go back to the heaven. So, that is elaborated. Then, finally, the Brahma Sutra speaks of material and efficient cause and for that it is Shruti or the Vedas or ultimate Pratyaksha or valid means of knowledge. So, that way the six systems of Indian philosophy, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, Purvimamsa and the Uttaramimamsa try to reach the truth in their own ways in with their own methods and finally all promoted one supreme thing to understand the highest truth, to understand one's own self, to be free from the clutches of ignorance, ajnana, from the clutches of nescience, avidya, to obtain moksha or liberation, freeing from the cycle of the birth and death. Thank you one and all. We hope you have enjoyed this philosophical session.